Baptist Church. You guys stand with us. We're going to get our time of worship started, singing praise and lifting high the name of Jesus. Here we go. Can you clap with us? And I know you can sing with us. Our God is a firm foundation and a solid rock. Let's lift his name high in this place today. Here we go. Our God, a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. As nations rise and fall, kingdoms once strong now shaken. Kingdoms once strong now shaken, but we trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. Trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. excited to be here today. Yeah, watching you guys walk in with smiles on your face, I can't think of a better place to be today than serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the house of the Lord at Coast, and we are glad that you are here. You guys be seated for just a couple minutes. Man, what an awesome day to be with you. If you're here with us for the first time, this is what we do every week. You've been missing out, so we're glad that you're here today. 
And if you've never filled out one of our Connect cards, here's what we ask of you. If you're watching online, thank you for joining us today. We ask you the same thing. Fill out one of our Connect cards. In the house, they're in the seat in front of you. Just pull it out and fill it out for us. Take it to the welcome desk in the lobby on your way out. And we've got a gift for you. If you're doing it online, just go to our website. Go to coastal.com. Click on the Connect tab. And you can fill out the uh, digital copy there. And we would love to get to know you and meet you today. So please do that for us. A few things that are going on. Don't forget, if you have signed up for Discover Coastal, that is today. It is 4 o'clock. Make sure that you're here, ready to go. We're going to have a great time of uh, just teaching for a little bit of time. And then we're going to have a meal, some fellowship. So make sure you're here if you've signed up for Discover Coastal 4 o'clock today. And ladies, don't forget, your simulcast is coming up at the end of September. We want to make sure that you have signed up. So go to our website or the app and click on the events tab for the ladies going beyond simulcast. We want you to sign up. Daniel, I hear you got something for us this morning. Yes. So when we say production team, we're talking about the camera guys. We're talking about the guy on the soundboard. There's a whole crew of people in a room back there that are doing all kinds of stuff to make this thing happen that you don't even see or don't even think about. But guess what? We are in a season of growth. We are in a season of change, a season of leveling up. So it is a fun time to get in on the production team. I'm excited about some things that are coming that I'm not even gonna tell you guys about, but you're gonna <laughs> see before the end of the fall, like big changes are happening. And so if you're technical minded, but even if you're not, and you wanna get in on a fun team, join the production team. There is going to be an orientation on Thursday night, August the 24th. You show up here at six, they're gonna have pizza for you and they're gonna show you every single position that takes place on the production team. And you can be like, hey, that seems fun. I think I could do that. Even if you've never messed with a computer, I bet we can find a job for you. So come to the orientation on August the 24th. It's a Thursday night and you can register. So please do let us know you're coming. Talk to me, talk to Paul around the place. You'll see him walking around and uh, we want you to be a part of it. It's a good time to jump in, thanks. Yeah, make sure you don't miss that. The other thing we wanna say next week, the 21st, we've got our baptism service. What a precious time and we want you to be involved. If you have never been baptized to publicly declare that you trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, we wanna celebrate that with you next week. It's not too late to sign up. Go onto the website, go onto the app, click on the baptism tab, and we will have one of our pastors get in touch with you. We want to celebrate. Make sure you go ahead and do that, and we will be in touch with you to go over all of the details, okay? The last thing is our offering, and we continue to say thank you for your faithfulness to be able to give to this ministry to allow us to reach the world with the news of Jesus Christ. That's what we've been called to do, and you enable us to do that each and every week, and we thank you for that. Y'all pray with me this morning. Lord, you are so good. And as we sang the first song, you are the only king forever. God, we just worship your name. You are mighty, you are powerful, and you are merciful. And we are grateful for that today. I pray that you would fill this house, continue as we lift up your name in worship and that we hear the word of God opened to us. I pray that you would just make our hearts available to you today to hear and to change who we are so that we can honor you in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all stand together, turn around and greet your neighbor. Let's sing together, you guys. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow out in vain, stay fast and let my heart learn when you speak a word. It will come to pass in great.
to step into your presence, that you invite us to that sacred place where you are worshiped and adored. And thank you for writing us into that story. Thank you 
for making a way for us to enter in. Lord, we pray that you will be honored, glorified, blessed by our worship today. And we pray that your spirit will move and speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Good morning, Coastal. How are you guys doing? We had an awesome day yesterday with the men, a whole weekend. Friday and Saturday, we had 85 guys come out. Not just for a Bible study, but for the beginning of Coastal Kingdom Men, a ministry to men, which every man is a part of. So if you couldn't be there, we've got a lot more coming for you starting in the fall. News about that to follow. But it was an awesome time. And you'll see the guys wearing their T-shirts. It was really great. So make sure you join in at the next time we have something. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, God, for this church and what you did yesterday. And Lord, the hope of your word is incredible. And this may be one of the most inspiring passages, surprisingly, Lord, that I've ever seen. I pray that your word would go forth in power. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was in college, I was a pre-med major, and I had a friend who was in the same track with me. But my friend never paid attention to uh, what he needed to do to go to medical school or what being a doctor would like or what it would take um, to get there. And he was all concerned about the here and now. He didn't research it. He didn't um, find out what he should be doing right now to um, be accepted. He didn't know much about it. He was living for the four years of college instead of the 60 years that was, that would to follow. He focused on this present life and circumstances instead of what would last so much longer. And in a way he was a fool because he never took the time to learn about the future. He never considered what he was doing now might affect what's coming later and he didn't get in. And you look at that and you say, well, why would he do that? Why would he not look to the future and learn about it so that he could uh, uh, apply it now? Why would he live for four years and then mess up the, uh, the rest of the 60? But I propose that many of us are doing that exact same thing right now, even though we're Christians. Let me explain. But first, raise your hand if you're in your 30s. 40s, 50s, I'll stop there. (laughs) Now, how many years do you have left before you die? 50 if you're lucky, 60 maybe, right? It's really really not that long. The great deception of the devil is to deceive you into thinking that your life consists of just this present time here on earth. He wants to either, one, trick people into missing the next life by focusing on this life so that you don't get saved and you spend eternity apart from the Lord in hell, or he wants to fool Christians who are in part of the kingdom and to just so focused on this life that they make the same mistake that my friend did, right? You have been brainwashed by society, by the media, by everything around you, that your life mainly consists of your present time here on earth before you die. You have been brainwashed and it started from the time that you were born. And many of us, even if we 
do know that there's something more coming or are focused on it, have the complete wrong idea about it. And we're going to set the record straight. You see, the devil doesn't want you to know that you have a whole nother life coming right here on this earth. And that it lasts a lot longer than this one. What you know about the future affects the present. And what you don't know about the future really affects the present. You have to know what's coming because it will affect how you live now. Now, how many people are waiting for heaven to be with the Lord? Who's excited about that? <laughs> right? And, and, you know, but is it really about heaven? Is it? What is heaven? What do you know about it? What is your idea? Is it some nebulous existence of playing harps in the clouds? Ring, ring, ring. I mean, is that what it is? No. But I, I, I submit to you, a lot of you, a lot of you think that. The devil wants you to think that your life in the next life is merely going to be that. So you're like, well, there's no reality to it. I'll just be playing, you know, harps in, in heaven. Right? But this is false. The coming kingdom is about a restored earth with literal, physical glorified bodies that we will be. And then in the final, which you'll hear next week, earth and her heaven merged together forever. But it is not some nebulous spiritual existence. So you say, well, why do we focus on this? Because we don't know the word. We don't know what God has told us. It's in there, and we're going to look at it and set this record straight so that we don't make the mistake that my friend made and are sorry. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, starting in verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who would not worship the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years years. Do you, you see a pattern there of a thousand years? How many times have I said it? Verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign with him how long? A thousand years. You are going to live on this earth for a thousand years in a restored earth just like Eden was. It's not going to be completely perfect, but it's close. And that's a long time. And what you're doing now will affect how you live then. So we're not going to make the mistake that my friend in medical school made. So let's talk about this. We're going to look at five aspects of the millennium. Five aspects and ask five simple questions. Number one, what is the millennium? Number one, what is the millennium? Well, if you recall from last week, the tribulation, the seven years of the terrible time on the earth is over, and Jesus has come back with his church. Hallelujah. He's back. He finally came back after all this time. People are saying, oh, he's never coming back. Well, he's back now, and he's on the earth with his church and now he's going to set up the millennial reign. So we're gonna have a thousand year literal reign on this earth with Jesus here reigning in person from Jerusalem. That's what it is in a simple fashion. The Antichrist and the devil have been defeated. They've been thrown into the lake of fire and um, they're not coming back, the Antichrist and the false prophet, okay? Now, this is a literal 1,000 years. 
It's a literal. Don't spiritualize it into some long period of time or something. How many said it? Six times. A thousand years means a thousand years. There's a simple uh, Bible study interpretation rule that you should know. If the simple sense is present, seek no other sense or you will make nonsense. If the simple sense is present, don't try and make it into something else because you, oh, a thousand years. It can't mean that. No. That's what it means, and if you make it into something else, you're gonna make nonsense. Now think about it, a thousand years is a long time. If we go back from today, that would be 1022 AD. Think about what's happened since then. That's 400 years before the Reformation and the Renaissance even started. America's only 250 years old officially. A thousand years. It's a very long time. So we're going to have a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth. Number two, when and how does it start? Well, when does the millennium start and how does it start? What happens? Okay, well, we know from Scripture that 75 days after Jesus returns with his church and has his second coming. That's when the millennium starts. I'm not going to get into it. It's in Daniel and in Revelation. It's very clear when you do the math. But there's a 75-day delay. And that's two and a half months. That's a long time. You say, well, what, what, what's Jesus doing for two and a half months? What's going on? Why don't they just get it started? I'm going to tell you why. Number one, Satan is bound. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Satan is bound in all of his demons. They cannot have any influence. Look at it again. Verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a while. So remember what I said, that the devil's deal is to deceive you into focusing on this world because it says that he shall deceive the nations no more. But make sure that you're not deceived now. So God's going to shut him up for a thousand years. He can't have him and his friends can't have any reign or rule. Now, we don't need them as th- th- those guys, as we're going to see, to do evil. Don't blame everything on the devil, right? But there's an important principle here about the devil's deception. Let's look at 1 John 2, chapter, uh, verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world, do you see they keep saying it, and the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The devil wants you to focus on this fallen world that is passing away and not the coming kingdom. And he uses these three things to get you. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Okay? The temptation to feel the temptation to have, the temptation to be. That's what those things are. Now, those three things, guys, are God-given, but not the way they're currently used and twisted by sin and the fall and the enemy. You have a desire to feel, but the presence and glory and love of God. You have the desire in you to have your needs met by God and then give back to everyone else who doesn't have and you have the desire in you to be great, and a person who has significance in eternity following God's will and plan for your life, but it's twisted against you, and you seek the world from it. That's the devil's deception. God will give you all three in the right context if you give yourself to him, and that defeats all three of those key attacks against the enemy. It's very powerful when God has those three desires in you and he's guiding them, it's like water on the devil's fire against you. So number two, what will happen is there's going to be the judgment of those who survive the tribulation. There's going to be people who survive the tribulation, saved and unsaved. Not a lot of people, but there's going to be enough. And it's in Matthew 25 and it's in 
uh, Ezekiel 20. There's a, a sheep and goat judgment. Je Jesus is going to sort them out. So only the saved people are going to go into the millennium. He's going to sort them out in that 75 days. And then number three, he's going to resurrect all Christians who died during the tribulation. There's going to be a lot of them, as Pastor Greg has taught you. They're going to get resurrected at this point. Let's go back and look at it. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image. And just a little aside there is a clue, maybe, I don't know. Who beheads people? Who beheads Christians is a sign of what might be going on in the end times. Think about it. What's the one group that beheads people? Interesting. Anyway, don't miss that clue. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. Hmm. So all those people who got saved during the tribulation and then were martyred, and that's most of them, Jesus is going to resurrect them after he comes back and before the millennium starts. They will get resurrected into their glorified bodies. We'll talk about that. And then he's also, obviously the church has been resurrected, and he's also going to resurrect all the Old Testament saints, most people believe at this time. So that when we go into the millennium, all the saved people, up until this point, will have their glorified bodies. Okay? And... That's the first resurrection, that the, all those occurring. That's not all at once, it's occurring over time. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection, and that happened 2,000 years ago. He was the prototype of us, okay? But it talks about this second death, because the second resurrection, as we're going to see at the end, is for all the unbelievers who didn't make it at the great white throne judgment. And he talks about the second death, that you can escape the second death. What's he talking about? Well, death is separation. When you die, you don't cease to exist. Your spirit leaves your body, your physical body, and you fall over flat. It's like taking the, the uh, uh, software out of a computer. You remove the software and the computer turns off. The real you is the software, the hardware is just the body, right? And the second separation then is if your spirit or soul is separated from God forever. The second death. So death is separation. And what he's saying is that if you're born twice, if you're born again, you'll only die once. But if you're only born once, you're not born again. Jesus said you must be born again to see heaven, then you will die twice. You'll have two separations. When you die physically, your spirit will be separated from your body, the first death. And then because you weren't saved, you're going to get separated from God from eternity, the second death. And you don't have to experience the second death. You certainly do not want to. So number three about the millennium, who will be there, right? We know um, when it's going to start and how it's going to start, but who's going to be there? Well, it's pretty easy. Number one, the church in our glorified bodies. We're going to come back and talk about that. What do you mean glorified body? I'm going to tell you, don't worry, right? We'll have the tribulation saints. We just saw that people who got saved in the tribulation and they're glorified in their resurrected bodies. The Old Testament saints will be there. And then all the saved people that Jesus sorted out, that, that made it through his judgment, that survived, that didn't die, they're going to be there. So at the beginning of the millennium, everyone's a believer. Hallelujah, everybody. Everybody is a believer. But those saved people who will still be you know, marrying, and we'll talk about that, and having kids are going to have kids. And those kids are going to have to choose to be saved and born again, just like we are here today. And unfortunately, from what we tell from Scripture, a lot of them aren't going to do it, because they're still going to have all their sinful natures. All those people who didn't get resurrected, all those people who survived, and all their kids for a thousand years, there's going to be a lot of people, don't, they still have a sinful nature. They have to choose Jesus, and they're not going to do it, which is crazy. So then number four, the most important and exciting part is what will it be like? What will the millennium be like? What's this thousand years going to be like? Well, it is a restored earth, partially restored. Sin won't be completely removed, 
like it will in the final heaven, but it's going to be as close to Eden as possible. It's going to be changed socially, ecologically, biologically, financially, right? And it's not a nebulous cloud existence. This is, it's going to be as real as this earth is now. It's going to be just as real. The end game, guys, is a restoration of the earth back to Genesis like it was, with God here in person. It's not something up in the clouds. Yes, right now, the people who have died and are waiting for the return, they are in kind of a spiritual existence awaiting, but that's not the end game. The end game is a restored earth, and it starts with a 1,000 years. And there are 400 verses from 20 passages about the millennium. And there is more written on the millennium than any other time period in the entire Bible. So obviously God wants us to know about it, but we don't know and we don't read and I can't read the Old Testament because it's old and we're New Testament Christians and we don't know the hope. And we can end up like my friend in medical school if we're not careful. We're going to be going like back to Eden with the curse lifted. The millennium will be like Eden. Not perfectly, but very close. I'm going to show you why. So, what's it going to be like? Well, number one, Satan and the demons are bound. There's no demonic influence or deception. None. That's incredible. Celebrate. No demonic deception for a thousand years. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is going to be physically reigning on the earth from Jerusalem in the new temple. The last Adam will be reigning over the restored Eden. He is going to be here in person. Israel and Jerusalem will be the center of the world. There will be a new temple built. That's in Ezekiel 40 through 47. Israel will be back in the land, living in peace and prosperity, fulfilling tons of Old Testament prophecies. And they will have a new land division, which is in Ezekiel 48. Let me read you a passage that talks about the millennium, a famous one. Isaiah chapter 2, starting in verse 2. Isaiah 2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There's not going to be any war. It's going to be a time of peace. And in Isaiah 11, verse 4, it says, But with righteousness... He, Jesus, shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. There will be some sin because remember we've got all these people who have a sinful nature but it's going to be dealt with in some way, I don't know how, immediately almost by Jesus and his glorified saints which is us. Now, in this millennium, all Christians are going to be on the earth in glorified bodies. You will be in your resurrected body. Well, what's this like, you say? Well, you look at Jesus. Remember, he was the God-man, so when he was resurrected as a man, you can look at him and know what you will be like. And what was he like? He was, a, he was his own person. People say, well, are we going to know each other in heaven? Duh, yeah. You're not stupider than you are before you're before. Come on, guys. We're going to get these ideas out of your head. You're going to be your own person in a perfected body that cannot get sick, that cannot be hurt, that cannot die, that is free from pain and disease and death forever. And even more importantly, right, Jesus said, I have flesh and bones. There's flesh and bones of some different manner than what we have now. And he ate. You're going to be eating. I don't think in gluttony because we're not going to have a sinful nature, but your sinful nature will be removed. You will never, ever sin again. Crazy how he's going to get it out. My wife said to me, I don't know how he's going to get it out of you, the sinful nature. It's a miracle. <laughs> Gosh. Oh. 
Well, it doesn't end there with my loving wife. But first, just realize that your role in the millennium will be based upon your faithfulness now. This is important, or you're going to be like my medical school friend. What you're doing now is going to affect how you live in the millennium. You're going to have jobs. There's going to be things to do. There's going to be governments, administrations, nations. It's going to be just as real as this, but without the sin, and it's a thousand years. Why are we focusing on this fallen 30 years and not focusing on what's coming? We're not going to be married in the millennium. I don't make any comments. They asked Jesus in Matthew 22, talking about the resurrection, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. So I was talking about this when I was studying, and I told my wife, trying to be lovey-dovey and caring, I said, oh, I'm really sad that you know, we're not going to be married in, in heaven. You know, I'm, I'm kind of upset about that. You know what she said? Hallelujah, a thousand years of peace. <laughs> a thousand years of peace is coming for me. Oh my gosh. That goes both ways. I can watch all the football I want, all the golf, and not get in trouble. I won't have a list to do. Now look guys, there are certain phrases that are for women only that you cannot say, and that's one of them. Don't go home and say, a thousand years of peace is coming for me. You're a dead man. <laughs> women can say it to men, men cannot say it to women, just like this one, I told you so. Don't ever say I told you so. Women can say it all they want, and it's fine, but don't you men say I told you so, or you'll remember that I told you so. So you won't, be, <laughs> you won't be married. Oh my gosh. So there's gonna be lots of safe people who survive the tribulation and enter the millennium, and they will have children, and they will still have sinful natures. Interesting, there's gonna be an interesting mix of, of glorified people living with people who aren't glorified. They're gonna know, hey, these are like different than us. We're gonna be living on this earth Together, the earth will be functioning in peace and harmony and, uh, as we reign with Jesus. There's not going to be war, but there will be conflicts. There will be things that Jesus has to deal with that we will have to help him deal with, right? And we're going to have jobs and duties, and, and there's going to be governments and administrations, right? There will still be sin, but somehow it's going to be dealt with immediately. And really interesting, the lifetimes are going to be extended. Not for us, because we're going to now, we're, we're glorified. We're not dying anymore. But for the regular people who are in this period, and they're going to multiply fast. Think about how many people we have in America, even in the past 150 years. Look at a population boom. So in a thousand years, in a perfect environment, there's going to be a lot of people. But Isaiah 65, verse 20 says, No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. So someone who's 100 years old will be like a child. It's going to be going back before the, the, the flood where people lived for a long period of time. Death and disease will be gone. And again, you've been brainwashed into thinking that a normal lifespan is, say, maybe 70 to 100 years. It's not true. A normal lifespan as intended is forever. That's why eternity is in your heart. That's why when you go to a funeral or someone dies or even a dog dies, it hurts. You were never meant to experience death. You were created for eternity, and everyone will live forever just in one place or the other. There will be peace in the animal kingdom. Look at Isaiah 11. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. 
They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the seas. So even the animals are going to be at, at peace. So just think about it. Everything that you worry about now, gone. All of it. There isn't going to be anything to worry about for you. And you're going to be on this earth for a thousand years living a life kind of like you live now to some degree. It's not going to be some weird existence of little physical earth. And it's a long time and you need to take it seriously because again, what you're doing now is going to affect how you live then. There's going to be no disease, no worry, no fear, peace and prosperity. You're not going to have to worry about money. You're not going to have to worry about your health. You're not going to have to worry about getting cancer. You're not going to have to worry about losing your loved ones. It's going to be a literal utopia. And this isn't even the final eternal state, which Pastor Greg will teach on next. But this is going to last a thousand years. That's a long, long time. That's at least 10 to 20 times longer than your normal lifespan. And it's coming. And finally, number five, how does it end? How does the millennium end? Let's go back and read the last part of this chapter, starting in verse seven. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever. So at the end of the thousand years, the devil's gonna be let back out and people are gonna rebel. All those people who were on the earth for a thousand years are going to rebel against God, even though he's physically present there. Amazing. It'll answer the question, one of all, is man basically good? Or the devil made me do it? Because it's going to be a perfect environment, and you're still going to have people not choosing Jesus. Now think about it. He's here on the earth. If you don't believe, you can go see him. You're going to be living with people who are glorified. You're going to know that there are these perfected people with you. The Bible will be proven true cover to cover without any question. Because you're going to be able to read about the tribulation, read about the thousand years, read about Jesus being there. And if you don't believe it, you can go to Jerusalem and see him for yourself. And they're still not going to believe. There's still going to be a rebellion. Incredible. And I think it'll be like today. People are going to be concerned about going to the mall and having their families and going out to dinner and, you know, taking their trips and whatever it is, and they're not going to have time to hear about no Jesus, even in this environment. Crazy. And then the most sobering part is that at the end of the millennium after that, then there's the final great white throne judgment for all the people who did not believe. And unfortunately, a lot of them are going to be people who lived in this period and still chose not to believe. And this is very sobering. Verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it and from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Wow. Look, if you're here today, you've heard the truth. You've heard it all along. But you do not want this, this judgment. Why would you want that? Why would you reject Jesus who came and died for you and gives you this incredible hope of eternal life, of a real life as your real person. First for a thousand years on this earth in a perfect state and then for eternity with him in the new heavens and new earth which we'll learn about next week. And the second death is bad because your soul will know that you missed it, that you heard, and you rejected, and you didn't believe, and you didn't live for the Lord, 
and your soul will know that it was meant for God and you missed it, and that's the torment. There doesn't need to be any more torment for that. Or if you're a believer and you make it into the millennium, you could be like, man, I blew it. I spent all my time on this earth just living for 30 or 40 years, and now here I am in a thousand. And sure, you're still going to be, but you're going to know that you blew it. Because it says in Revelation chapter 22 that every tear will be wiped away. There's going to be tears that we shed, probably based upon our regrets. I don't know. So don't make the mistake today. If you're here today, give your life to Jesus. Pray, Lord, you died for me. I give my heart to you. Save me. I don't want the second death. Pray it right now in your heart. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Lord, it's such incredible hope of eternal life, a real life, here on this earth in eternity with you, merged together. If you're here today, don't experience the second death. Give your life and heart to Jesus right now. Ask him to save you, forgive you of your sins. And for all the believers in here, start living for the Lord now. It will affect your millennial life. Don't be like my friend in college who focused just on this life and didn't focus on what was coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. The good news about today is that we get to go back to the throne room. We get to keep coming back to that fountain that will never run dry, the living water. Let's worship God today. Gathered at the highest throne, welcome by a melody. I have always known a song that's always been in me. All glory and honor, dominion and power to you. A million angels fall, face down on the floor, all to ego. Face down on the 
there before the throne of grace majesty before my eyes i'll let it take my breath away a million angels fall face down on the floor all to echo Awesome morning, and I'm so thrilled to see how God is working and moving at Coastal. If you haven't jumped on the bandwagon yet, you better, because good stuff's happening. Um, don't forget tonight's that 101 class if you're signed up. Uh, be here for that. Otherwise, I'll be looking forward to seeing you guys next week. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>